So um, thanks for the overwhelming introduction, Giorgio. So um, yesterday, we probably realized that uh, brains come in all uh, shades and colors. And today, we've also been introduced to the scale, the, the complexity, and the size um, by Jeff. So today is the day of uh, color blue. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly uh, provide a flavor of one of the manifold ways of reconstructing and modeling uh, a piece of uh, brain tissue. So this is what we've been doing in the Blue Brain Project uh, to reconstruct and simulate a piece of uh, the neocortex. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to start by um, uh, quoting uh, Christoph Koch and uh, Clay Reed. So um, uh, basically, Christoph and Clay said that at any large neuroscience gathering, once really stuck by the pace of discovery, so there are thousands of neuroscientists running away in all directions. It's like a scientific big bang. So, I mean, independence in neuroscience is really necessary, but this has prevented neuroscience from entering a more mature phase, which could involve developing common standards and collaborative projects. We heard a bit about common standards yesterday. Uh, and of course, neurophysiologists are more likely to eat you, uh, each other's toothbrushes than share data and models, of course. Okay, so, I mean, th this is how I see the, the field to be fragmented. I mean, we're all these different neuroscientists. We like doing our own little things, our own niche areas. Uh, but then, uh, of course, I mean, to, to understand the brain, it's, it's imperative that we bring about all these approaches together. I mean, all approaches are equally necessary. It's really uh, joining hands, multiple disciplines that will help us understand the, the brain. So and one such integrative approach is what we've been developing in, in the Blue Brain Project. So in a, in a nutshell, what this approach entails is uh, we obtain sparse experimental data across different levels of biological organization, neurons, synapses, connectivity, microcircuit physiology, identify certain inductive principles, rules of organization across these different levels of um, uh, biological data, and then use these rules and principles to constrain algorithms to then build in silico models of these different biological uh, uh, layers, uh, and then integrate these component models into a complex or a dense reconstruction which we call, I mean, th this whole process, I mean, it's, it's akin to basically an inverse problem. Um, and, and of course, it's also important to, to ensure that these models at different levels are actually validated to, to make sure they're consistent with what's seen in, in biology. Uh, so, I mean, th this is more of, of like a, a detailed view of the so-called iterative predictive reconstruction and experimentation, this technique that we've been uh, developing in, in, in Lausanne. So we gather experimental data, um, use these to um, build unifying brain models, uh, build several models, uh, simulate these models, analyze and visualize the outcome of these models, validate these models, as I mentioned before. So this is basically you know, like an endless loop. So you can, you can go on doing this refine your model forever. So it's, it's never ending to speak of. So the, the reconstruction workflow that we've developed uh, in, in the Blue Brain project so, uh, entails uh, these, these different steps. The very first step was to actually map out the diversity of morphological types in the neocortical microcircuit. So if, if I were to give a metaphor, so imagine you were tasked with squishing the complexity of the Amazonia onto a pinhead. So it's something like that. So, I mean, in, in the Amazonia, you have flora of all shapes and sizes, like apple trees, orange trees, mango trees, whatever, right? So similarly, in the neocardical microcircuit, you have uh, about 55 different morphological types. So there are Martinotti cells, there are basket cells, there are chandelier cells, there are pyramidal cells, of course, from layers two, three to six. Um, so experimentally, we mapped out that across six layers, in the neocortical microcircuit, there are about 13 different excitatory morphological types and 42 different inhibitory morphological types. So these are the, the different uh, trees of different shapes and sizes in the Amazonia. Um, and then uh, having mapped out the, uh, the, the diversity of uh, morphological types, uh, the next step was to actually clone these morphologies in sufficient numbers. I mean, of course, 
Um, even if we were to do experiments in a lifetime, there's no way we would be able to obtain uh, unique morphological reconstructions for all the thousands of neurons in a tiny part of the brain. So then we had to clone these morphologies in sufficient numbers. So we had a representative set of the 55 different morphological types. So now having mapped the different morphological types, the next step was to um, actually map out the dimensions of the circuit to populate these morphologies. So um, this process entailed uh, two steps. So the first step was to map out the, the thickness of um, a prototypical neocortical microcircuit, which is roughly uh, two millimeters in height across the six different layers, and then to map out the individual layer thicknesses from one to six, as well as to measure the neuronal densities across these different layers. Now, having mapped out the thickness of all six layers and the neuronal densities across different layers, we were then able to estimate the number of neurons across these different layers, uh, as well as uh, estimating the diversity of morphological composition across these different layers. We know, for example, that layer one only has inhibitory neurons. There are six different types. So what are their proportions? So neuron type A in layer one uh, is about 30%, type B is about 40%, so on and so forth for all the other layers. So now having mapped out the diversity, having populated these in a, in a network dimension, the next step was to actually connect these neurons. So neurons, as we all know, are promiscuous beings. They don't like to be solitary. They like to make contact and connect to each other. Uh, so uh, the, the connectivity was uh, actually derived uh, algorithmically uh, by um, uh, dumping all these morphologies to speak of uh, into a bucket. That's this uh, network dimension, and then um, running an algorithm on a supercomputer that detected all possible axodendritic acquisitions between all neurons. So you, you go to each neuron and ask the axon of this neuron, what are the acquisitions that you're forming with the dendrites of all postsynaptic neurons? And, and this way, we determined a so-called structural map of connectivity. Of course, we know that, um, I mean, uh, all-to-all connectivity is, is not possible, so therefore a, a, a fraction of these structural contacts are actually converted into functional synapses. So we have some experimental data on um, the structural to functional proportion of synapses that, that we used to constrain this algorithm uh, and, and, and then develop like a, a, a blueprint of connectivity in, in the microcircuit. So this was about the anatomy. So the, the physiology is, of course, equally mind-numbing, as, as probably all of us know. So just as th there's the staggering complexity of morphological types, there's also a complexity in terms of the diversity of electrical types. So uh, we mapped out experimentally that there are about 11 different electrical types uh, in, a, in a typical neocardical microcircuit. Uh, so there are uh, stuttering uh, firing patterns, there are accommodating firing patterns, there are fast spiking patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so then uh, having determined the morphological types and the electrical types, we, we then mapped out a proportion of what morphological type expresses a diversity of electrical types, so what we call a morphoelectrical type. So the next step was to map out the synaptic diversity. So we, we, we connected neurons in this step, but then what's the language that these neurons use to communicate with each other? That we measured experimentally again and found, found out that there are about six different synapse types in the neocortical microcircuit. So there are three excitatory and three different inhibitory types based on their release probabilities, synaptic dynamics, peak conductances, et cetera, et cetera. And now, so having mapped out the uh, anatomy and then the physiology, so lo and behold, so we, we generated a, a virtual tissue uh, that we were able to use to, uh, to uh, uh, simulate and experiment and, and then look at uh, the emergent dynamics of uh, this reconstructed neocortical microcircuit. And just to give you an idea for the kind of uh, work that went in to, to generate this small little piece of tissue in silico. So this really, uh, the output of about 15 years of experiments, thousands of neurons were recorded and labeled, many thousands classified, uh, several thousand recordings of uh, electrical and, and, and synaptic types that all went in. So th this is really the, the digital reconstruction in its gory detail. So as I said, it's about two millimeters thick about 0.3 millimeter cube in volume. It has 55 different morphological types, uh, 11 different electrical types, 207 morphoelectrical types, uh, the synaptic anatomy and, and the synaptic physiology. Um, okay, so 
uh, this is a depiction of the morphological diversity in, in greater detail, the diversity that I spoke about earlier. So as you see, uh, layer one has six different uh, neuron types, which are all inhibitory. The pyramidal morphological types only start from uh, layers two, three, all the way to six. And the, uh, the complexity of these pyramidal morphologies increases as you go from layers two, three, to all the way to six. And the inhibitory morphological types so, uh, I mean, they are the same in terms of types from layers 2, 3, 2 to 6. So they're Martinotti cells, bitufted cells, double bouquet cells, bipolar cells, neuroglia form, basket cells, and chandelier cells. So uh, how did we actually reconstruct the, the density and, and map the uh, excitatory and inhibitory uh, neuron fractions and the dimensions? So, um, so this is more of, of, the, of a breakup of uh, the layer-wise uh, densities and, and uh, the number of neurons from uh, 2, 3 to 6. And, and these are the uh, individual uh, layer thicknesses that we mapped out experimentally. Uh, and uh, this is more of a, a depiction of the proportion of excitatory and inhibitory neurons across uh, different layers. Of course, as you see here, layer 1 is 100% inhibitory. Uh, and across uh, layers 2, 3 to 6, Roughly, uh, there's a proportion of 86% excitatory and about 14% inhibitory uh, neurons. So uh, this is a breakup of the, the composition, the morphological composition uh, of uh, neurons across different layers. Um, so th this is a breakup of the different pyramidal <coughs> types, which increase in complexity as you go from layers 2, 3 to 6. OK, so uh, to derive the connectivity that I mentioned earlier, so we, we came up with this uh, uh, four-step uh, three-rule algorithm. I won't really go into the details of uh, this algorithm. It's, it's all published. You can look <coughs> it up here. So the, the first step was to uh, really identify, as I said before, all the axonal oppositions of a single neuron. That's all the possible touches that the axon of a single neuron forms with all the other dendrites that are surrounding the single neuron. Uh, so the next step was to really prune uh, a number of, of these synapses, which we call a, a so-called uh, general pruning based on biological data, followed by a so-called multisynapse pruning. So we know that synaptic connections um, in the brain are mediated by multiple contacts, right? So it's pretty uh, uncommon to have a synaptic connection that just has one contact, right? So on average, in the neocortex, Excitatory connections are mediated by about five contacts. Inhibitory connections are mediated by about 10 contacts. So this step really then identified and pruned like uh, many of these uh, excess appositions such that we were uh, able to match like the profile of the distribution against uh, experimental data on a pathway specific basis. Um, and, and the final step was, was to really uh, prune this further uh, to, to, to make uh, uh, room for structural <laughs> plasticity and the reconfiguration of synaptic contacts. So uh, this way, using this uh, four-step, three-rule algorithm, we were able to uh, predict that there are about 37 million uh, intrinsic synapses just formed by uh, the overlap of intrinsic axons and dendrites in the neocardical microcircuit. 27 million of these are excitatory. 9 million of these are inhibitory. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is quite interesting. So uh, this is more in detail as to how we predicted intrinsic synapses. So uh, as I mentioned before, there are 55 different morphological types. Uh, so 55 squared is about 3,025 possible connections. Um, so we know uh, by virtue of axodendritic geometry that not all of these connections are actually viable. So it's only a fraction of these that are viable. So, uh, out of 3,025 possible connections, just about 2,000 are, are actually viable. And for these 2,000 connections, we have experimental data for less than 1%. So all the experimental studies out there have probably characterized about 20 or 25 of these 2,000 connections. So we really had to come up with, with rules to extrapolate the sparse experimental data to fill up this, this whole matrix of the 55 to 55 possible connection types. So I guess I... I just have about five minutes. Yeah, and I'm, yeah I still have a, five uh, Well, so there's still a, quite a bit to show. I, I, I did not even get to the simulation part. Uh, OK, so yeah, there's some that I really wanted to show. Right. 
Okay, so I mean, in a, in a nutshell, so what we're trying to do is to really build a pipeline for integrative neuroscience uh, as part of the so-called uh, simulation platform of the, the human brain project. Uh, we're integrating all the workflow that we've developed in the Blue Brain project uh, to be made available to, to, the, to the entire world, the tools, the workflow, the algorithms, everything through the brain simulation platform of the, the human brain project. And of course, we're also um, making all the the tools available. For example, we recently brought out this tool called BluePy Opt. Um, that's basically a Python optimizer uh, available on, on GitHub um, to uh, enable uh, like data-driven uh, modeling of uh, single neuron physiology. It was also recently published. And of course, more importantly, so I mean, this really the, the wall for any Pink Floyd uh, fans out there. So uh, we, we I, I believe are taking like a so-called middle out approach. So this is where data-driven detailed biological reconstructions stand as of today. Of course, I mean, we're always faced with a barrage of criticisms. There's one camp that says we don't have enough detail, that, oh, it's too premature to talk about an in silico reconstruction. The connectome still is going to take a decade. So what are you guys doing? Are you out of your mind? And then there's the other camp that says, oh, you guys are crazy. You have too much detail. So this, you have no hypothesis, so this is not science. You're just adding details willy-nilly, so you don't know what you're doing. And of course, uh, I mean, pe many people also tell us that I've learned nothing from what you do, so it's probably meaningless. But of course, again, to, to, to kind of contrast uh, the detail on one end of the spectrum uh, and, and, and simplified models on the other end of the spectrum, so what we're actually trying to do is to also come up with, with, with a with a procedure, with a, with a kind of a, a, a process, an informed process to move from complex models to, to simple models. So uh, we've actually come up with a, with a whole process to, to then systematically collapse the complexity of what we're trying to do into a simple point neuron network. So this is more of the, the details of this process. Uh, and, and, and basically, uh, so this uh, is a proof of concept of validation to, to actually show that the kind of emergent dynamics that, that we see in, in the complex network uh, following the systematic simplification is also seen in, in the simple network. Uh, so, uh, right, so set of general conclusions. So, uh, so what we see is that interdependencies in experimental data make it possible for a dense in silico reconstruction of uh, uh, a microcircuit of neurons. So simulations uh, reproduce in vitro and in vivo experiments, which I couldn't talk about a lot, without any parameter tuning. So um, and, and um, another conclusion from the study is that the neocortex reconfigures itself to support diverse information processing strategies based on extracellular calcium levels, which I couldn't really talk about. So. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. We have time for one question. Uh, if not, you want to to yes. That was wonderful. Great to, to see uh, all this work. And I think it's essential to, to put all these biological details together and in s by synthesis see what they entail functionally. Right. I'm um, coming more from a sort of computational perspective where the phenomenology that I would like to understand is brain computation and uh, behavior essentially, mm -hmm. right? And so I think one thing that uh, we have to achieve a sort of combining the, the top-down approach that goes from the overall function of the system and optimizing the function as people do in AI to uh, the more bottom-up and biologically driven neural network modeling. And one thing that uh, I think I would like to hear your take on is what is the phenomenology that you're trying to explain? Is it So for me, the phenomenology is the computation and the behavior, and I'm uh, interested in biological details to the extent extent that they help me understand the computation. So it's an empirical question for me whether spikes matter even. I think they do, that's my intuition, but I don't know that yet. Um, and all the neuron types, uh, you know, might all matter. There might, it might be that there's no level at which we can say we can abstract from this. But how do you think about this and what is the phenomenology that you're trying to explain with your modeling? So first of 
Paul, uh, yeah, uh, I agree with you that spikes matter. I think so too. Uh, well, the, the phenomenology is, well, th this is more of a, yeah, like a, a philosophical question. So all we're trying to do is to really play a biological limitation game. So we're studying a biological system across different levels of organization, looking at how it's all structured, and then copying this level of organization in a computer. So, I mean, one working hypothesis is that if you meticulously copy the biological structure uh, in, into a model, then the emergent dynamics that you see would be consistent with that of a biological system. So, I mean, in, in a way, th this is really looking at the structure from bottom up and, and then uh, rather than mapping the kind of emergent dynamics that, that comes out. So, in that sense, this is a very broad phenomenology, but, but uh, I mean, of course, we do have, we do, we do capture certain other uh, phenomenological details um, at these different levels of modeling. Uh, for, for example, uh, the phenomenology of synaptic transmission uh, that's captured uh, by um, uh, assuming that uh, at every uh, incoming spike, there's a fraction of resources available at a synapse uh, to be consumed. Uh, and depending on the kind of a synapse, uh, some fractions are some fraction of resources are consumed and some aren't and, and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure if I entirely answered your question, but I mean we could of course discuss later. <laughs>